Hello, everyone. Okay, uh, my name is Russell Watson, and I am really pleased to welcome you to the Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon Program. This afternoon, um, we'll be in discussion with Amir Hall, writer, uh, performance artist, um, video artist, um, a truly interdisciplinary practice. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to express a huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. Please feel free to ask questions in the comment section during the talk, and we'll get to those during the Q&A. Um, so without further ado, welcome, Amir. Hi, everybody. Hi, Russell. Thank How you. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. All right. Um, so I think we should just jump right in, Amir. Mm -hmm. And um, if we could have the first uh, video clip. What do you mean? What do you mean? Fresh out when you have a pressure. What kind of what, what kind of pressure? Hmm? Fresh out. Try to say you get anything easy. Yeah. Man, I don't work hard. Just get things easy. Let like me go take my last money and give you what me give you my last money. It hard because men had a work hard. I think years get easy now, but you know what they're trying to say. We still had a work. When I was. We had to work and work hard. We can't work like how them does work. And then no, no girl not giving a man an offer. They want. Well, she gives they want. So we had to offer money and we sell. Them just offering they sell. So that's the hardness. When he talking about, I understand what he saying. My wife even said that, but I get to he mentioned that. Yeah. So you feel that it's harder for men than for women in Trinidad? Well, not for me though, because I don't depend on nobody. I never had to depend on mommy and daddy. So when I get big and I, they had to depend on me. So that makes me talk for man. Mm -hmm. like, I just call myself. I don't know what you are saying, fellas. I tell them, no, I not talk for. Because you provide for yourself. You're not yes, and for. others. And even if I lost, God just give them more. Hmm. Um, right. So this, this interview is um, part of a, a larger project called son of man that you created with the immersive realities lab for humanities mm -hmm. um, and the project paired you with the nigerian artist uh sheila chukalozwe yes i pronounced that correctly Chukalozwe. and and it took you to lagos you actually went uh to lagos mm -hmm. and she came to trinidad and the project was exploring consistencies between those two spaces, um, mm -hmm. specifically in the ways in which notions of God and masculinity and fatherhood manifest themselves. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about the project um, in, in its kind of overall context and also more specifically about the consistencies that you found um, yeah. as a result of, in the project? Yeah, so um, Sheila and I met at Amherst College. That's where we uh, met. And in our last year, Sheila recommended um, reading the book of Job. She was really obsessed with that text. And I think she keeps coming back to it as an artist. Uh, and after that, we talked about the potential of doing this project, right? In which we would place our fathers in conversation with Job, the biblical Job. And we all know this, well, we might not all know the story, but Job, um, basically the devil, uh, well, God was boasting about Job. He's like, yeah, look at Job. That's my man's like, let's go. Job is hardcore about me. And then uh, Satan was like, I bet if, you know, you didn't treat him so nicely, he wouldn't be all happy and like praising you all the time. And God was like, well, try it, you know, except don't touch his body. So the first time um, 
all of his materials, his house, his farm, everything, you know, is destroyed. And then uh, he doesn't curse God, right? In the second instance, when Satan is given permission to touch his body, that's when he curses God, right? When he becomes really sick and, and stuff like that. And so it's a, a narrative about suffering and a narrative also about the nature of humanity and godhood. Because one of the things God does in the end, he presents himself to Job and he doesn't apologize or like explain his reasoning. He says, you can't understand the world. He says, I am God. I am omniscient. I'm all powerful, etc, etc. And what we were interested in was how manhood and fatherhood in both of our cultural um, milieus were defined around qualities that were associated with the Judaic biblical God, right? Um, men are called to be omniscient in a way. You know, they have to know things. And if you don't know, in a, especially in a public space, uh, it's kind of embarrassing, right? Uh, men are called to be all powerful, right? They're expected to be. And so what we did was um, by analyzing both of our father's lives, we created um, focus groups, right? Based on their experiences, who we would interview, right? And so the focus group in Trinidad was we, we were looking at men of different age groups at bars, right? And bars are this very specific um, masculine place within the cultural context of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. So it felt like in addition to the barbershop that bars would be a really like resonant place to get at what men themselves think of themselves, how they construct themselves. Um, so where were the consistencies? Like what did you, what did you find was consistent between, between Lagos and Port of Spain? You know, I think the, the consistencies would probably be the, the, the central things. And our project, uh, our approach to ethnography, just for context, doesn't seek findings. I think we're seeking questions and we're seeking to widen kind of the boundaries and the margins of those questions uh, and, and really deepen those. So in comparison, I could talk more about the consistencies were, I think the similarities were that in both places, men were expected to be, um, to have physical prowess. Uh, well, men define themselves as, you know, having to have physical, physical prowess and having to provide for people, including their family members, including women and stuff like that. I think- So the idea, the idea of, of man as, as kind of provider, um, yes. all knowing. And that, that was, was consistent. But yeah, when we when we talked, you talked um, initially. You had mentioned that mm -hmm. um, the the civil war in Nigeria had put a particular right. Um, right. patina on. Can you yeah. talk about that a little so bit? That was one of the questions that came up. Was as we spoke to men in Nigeria, uh, especially Igbo men, um, the question arose of how did the Biafran war affect uh, the, the construction of masculinity, if at all, within those cases? Because so many of the men that we spoke to, and it's a shame we don't have any recordings of those, um, well, any visual recordings. So many of the men that we spoke to harkened back to the Biafran war, right? As a moment, um, as an open wound, right? It was clear that there was no resolution. There was no opportunity to, to resolve or to talk through or to kind of process that um, moment. And so one of the things we did in response to that, um, so we look at ethnography, we take certain, we take the methodologies of ethnography. So, you know, focus groups, interviews, that kind of things. And we apply performance um, strategies to, to those kinds of explorations. So as opposed to a research paper, what we did was um, an interactive performance that we held at our living space in Lagos. Um, and that performance was meant to kind of reproduce what other countries had had. So like South Africa and Rwanda, they, they had uh, what was called, I forget what they were called. 
uh, the commission, the truth and yes, those truth and truth and truth and reconciliation committees, and we tried to to facilitate a conversation, right? And this performance was with um, Nigerian artists Shuku, Sheila Chukurozi, Yadichima, Uko Akalu, Dabarichi, Uko Akalu, and it was directed by Charlotte Brathwaite, who is a Bayesian American director. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so what that did was we allowed we were allowed to um, experience more um, the ideas that were going through uh, these masculine figures' heads around how does the Biafran War haunt the present, right? Um, and specifically um, haunt, haunts the presence in terms of how, how they perceive or construct their, their identity yeah, as men. Yeah, how they perceive and construct their identity. Did, you, was, did you find, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that was the major difference between what we experienced in Nigeria and what we experienced here. I think here we're still dealing a lot with a lot of the, we spoke to both men and women here, and a lot of people talked, um, you know, talked about slavery, uh, race came up um so there was a different idea of what it meant to be a black man as opposed to you know an indian man or a person of another race here because you know we have a lot of races here um and the other thing that was very starkly different was that uh men in the caribbean when talking about themselves rarely spoke about themselves outside of the context of women Right, so it was almost always in comparison or in relationship in relation, to right. women, which I mean doesn't surprise me. But no, uh, I mean so much of the conversation now is about about the binary nature of right. gender identity. You know, we kind of Absolutely. know that. Um, I want to talk about uh, the the performance that you you created um, in in Lagos with um, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, so when I was looking at your work, one of the things that I really enjoyed was uh, how you approach space, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, we, you said that you don't really consider your performance work to be conventional theater, right? right? Um, and one of the, you know, I mean, even though in, in terms of how it's constructed, there are a lot of markers that, um, are, the, are, are consistent with, with theatrical, like conventional theatrical practice. Right. But right. one of the things that really stood out to me is the multiplicity of spaces that you use, you know? On the one hand, there's um, these, these kind of semi-public spaces where, you know, they're gathering with people in, in um, like small spaces or domestic spaces, yeah. just both indoor and outdoor. There's some, um, uh, you know, stuff that you do that is in, in the formal theater environment and actual mm -hmm. theater with lighting and so on. But then there's also the stuff that you do that is in very private in your domestic spaces. Right. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you define the difference between your process and conventional theater. Like, have you really kind of targeted what, what differentiates it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, actually, Sheila was, Sheila Chikulosi, the artist I led Project Son of Man with, was um, the person that introduced me to devised theatre. Uh, and in, uh, devised theatre, for a lot of people, um, I think the main markers are that sometimes the script is the last thing that's finalised, right? So in traditional theater, you have a script, you have stage directions, and you go in with that, you begin rehearsing, you learn your lines, etc., etc. In the device process, in the um, process, we go into rehearsal first, right? We begin with the body, and um, we begin with the ideas. Sometimes we begin with images, and from there, we generate text. And sometimes that turns into a script, sometimes that turns into the spoken word. And, um, I think in our process, Sheila and I really widened what um, the device process to even outside of performance, right? So this entire perform um, project, Son of Man, takes a sorry. Can we can we get the, the the next image, uh, Philip, please? Mm -hmm, no problem. Yeah, go ahead, Amir. Yeah, uh, is he going to put it up now? Yeah. All right. Uh huh. Okay. 
Yeah, so on the left uh, is the performance that we did in Lagos um, called Happy Survival. And you can get a sense, you know, this isn't a home space. This is outside of um, a living complex called 1004. And you can see there's a proximity to, to the audience that traditional mm -hmm. theater doesn't really allow for. In fact, this prompt that we asked them to do, it was about suffering, right? And I, my character was, was um, experiencing suffering because I, we don't see it, but what we're standing on is gravel. The entire yard was gravel. Um, and Sheila's character was a preacher who was advocating for peace for me. And the only way that the audience could assuage my suffering was to touch me somewhere and to maintain co physical connection. And so that's why people's hands are on my body. And so it's a real way to, to think about how can we use the different um, elements of theater, the audience, the stage, to really get at the truth of the experience, not necessarily the idea but have people enter into that experience in an immersive way. So um, like through, through participation, be, being a, participati a participating member of the performance, not just yes. an observer of the performance. Yes, and then for us, it's a meaningful process because we also enter into that embodiment. So it becomes more than something that we can write about and understand in academic terms, but we can see in the, we can address in the body where those tensions kind of show up and where those releases show up. For instance, the first person to, to, um, to try to assuage my, my, um, my suffering by touching me, uh, I remember the kind of relief that that was because I had been standing there for quite some time. And that's um, next to the image of, oh, well, the, the next we can image. Come back, can we come back to that image really quick? Yeah. Well, yeah. So that was a performance I did in New York in February of this year. This is the, the, the image on the uh, frame right. Mm -hmm. With um, mm -hmm. Poetic Theater Productions. They have a program called Love Redefined, and it's held at uh, Judson Memorial Church. Um, which is which yeah. is a, a conventional performance space that's specifically designed for theatrical presentations. Yes, exactly. Right. And so you can get a sense of there's a clear delineation between stage, between performer, between audience. And but even in this, I would say, even in this, there was some tinkering with the form because I remember this this piece was about love. We were supposed to think about love, and one of the things I did was. I put out a request on my Instagram story and I said, hi friends, like, what do you all think about love? Like, um, and I asked them to send voice notes and the voice notes I then combined into, uh, um, into just a single recording that mm -hmm. when combined with, I worked with Warren Timoth, who is a Brooklyn based musician um, who created a score for the recording that I then danced to in addition to spoken word. Right. And so there's, even there, there's a, a pushing back on tradition, on institution. And that's why so much of, of our work draws on, you know, the conventional stuff like ethnography, like methodology. And it says, but what, how can we serve the, the question? You know what I mean? More than I think convention, yeah. Can we, can we get uh, the next image? <clears throat> so in addition to, to those two spaces, mm -hmm. um, there's also this other space that you work in, Amir, which is um, performance that is specifically for the camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily cinematic in the sense that, you know, the camera is being used in a way to you know impose cinematic language on the performance or to to you know uh shape the way the audience is seeing the performance right the camera yeah, is more yeah. of an observer so it becomes this very it's not quite cinema but it's not quite purely theatrical yeah. because of the presence of the camera and then in this case the audience isn't there at all Mm -hmm. right um can you talk about this mode and and what 
what the, the opportunities are for you as a performer in, in working in this way? Yeah. Um, no, it's so true. I like that question because there are multiple audiences. There's a primary audience of the camera mm -hmm. as you're doing performances. And then there's a secondary audience of whoever is in the yard because, you know, sometimes in Trinidad, people love looking. <laughs> you know, and um, so you have this sense of being observed that um, kind of mimics the audience feel that you would get in a, on, a, on a stage. And then you have the audience of the people who encounter it digitally. Um, so I think one of the, one of the main uh, takeaways from Project Son of Man for me was, was assuming permission to do this kind of thing. I think uh, uh, Sheila, as an artist, has a great way of, of um, just stepping into, in, into space, you know what I mean? Taking up space, even in public, in an, if the art demands it, right? Mm -hmm. And that was something I had to learn in this process. And that was something that, that was different, I think, between... I mean, and this is another conversation between uh, Nigerians and Trinidadians, and this is a generalization also, but Nigerians don't wait for permission. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they, just, <laughs> they just do the thing. It, uh, and it was so palpable and energy. And so that was one of the things that we took and brought back to Trinidad. And this is uh, the image here is in my home space where I used to live with my mom. Um, and so, for instance, there are different things that we're navigating in our home space, right? There's propriety, for instance. So mm -hmm. this is Sheila in this image. And for parts of it, uh, she's shirtless. And I was shirtless as well. But of course, you know, for a female body, that's a difference. And I remember, I remember that after this, this was taken, I was like, wait, let me just ask permission, <laughs> right? Because it, we were renting at the time and it wasn't um, our space. Right, uh, right, right. So that's different question. Oh, ask, ask the people who own the property permission. Yeah, yeah. So the oh. landlord who lived okay. on the on the compound, we had to ask permission. Ah, right, right, right. So there are different things in, in in occupying public space, but for me, it's a personal kind of push against respectability politics. I think, um, in my experience of Trinidad, I find that uh, people are really concerned with you know respectability and really aware of being observed by others mm -hmm. and therefore and in and therefore kind of like present themselves a certain way and the art for me allows me to kind of like assert freedom um in a space especially freedom with things that are conventionally considered transgressive so that's part of why um we do this work in this way uh with such different stages um, so I, you know, when I look at this mode, one of the things that I, I assume is that is that there is an incredible amount of privacy, right? Is that it is right. it, because there's no audience, because it's in a domestic space, right. um, that you do have this, you know, this security of privacy, right? right. Um, right. But you're saying that that's not quite this, the case, even in these kind of private domestic spaces when you do that do performances well, there. Yeah, what, what, what mm, I'm trying to say, yes, but and there's an intersection, right? Because there are levels of domesticity where, um, for instance, there's a freedom that uh, Sheila and I were trying to explore, and which was one of the reasons we chose to uh, costume her shirtless. And of course, the policing of the female body kind of like interrupted that right which was why she kind of brought her hair into that kind of thing right right so she um, felt she felt that uh the need to protect herself in those moments well especially after we had talked to the landlord and we didn't get permission i see um, i see and then i think for a for a queer person as a queer person um i was wearing a skirt in that video so even then there's this idea of okay, you know, what if somebody who pass try to say something, you know? Um, you know, how, how will the neighbors see this and how would my mother think right. about that as well? So even though it's a domestic space, I think there's certain, um, certain ways in which like inherent freedoms, even in the domestic space are um, restricted by 
gender norms and gender expectations. And that's what we're trying to work with and against. So, well, this, this uh, brings me to my next question, you know, the idea of, of you know, the safety or assumed safety of home versus mm -hmm. the, the vulnerability of being, you know, in the public or outside of, of your home space. Now, you went to Amherst, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was there that your work really you know, evolved into this interdisciplinary practice. I mean, you were saying that more than, more so than anything else, you kind of lean towards writing as your primary practice, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then you, you end up at Amherst and performance starts to take a bigger role, video starts to take a bigger role. And the right. idea of, of working interdisciplinary takes on a bigger role. Um, so right. I'm wondering about you know, what your come up, so to speak, was like in Trinidad that would have primed you for that kind of of, uh, of transition from being, considering yourself, you know, singularly a writer and then being able to, to take on this approach. Yeah, mm, so I wouldn't even say that I considered myself a writer before leaving Trinidad. I think I could. You, you did not. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say that. At that point, I was in that conversation with my parents where I was like deciding what I would major in. And they were like, oh, do economics or uh, languages, you know, do what will make you money. And of course, you know, that comes from, that comes from a desire for my safety, right? And for my stability. Russell? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Right. Um, so I was still in that conversation, but I will credit, um, my last two years of, of Queen's Royal College, uh, that's where I went here with exposing me, like really triggering that interest in writing. So I remember reading Purple High Discuss uh, with my teacher, Miss Abner, shout out to Miss Abner. Um, reading Purple High Discuss by Chimamanda and Gozadichi, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like this is, you know, this is gorgeous. This is something that I really connect with and I would like to explore this in more. Um, performance, I found at QRC as well, but not in classes. So of course, mm. uh, there's this prevailing idea that uh, the performing arts um, aren't for boys, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if that right. governs QRC's decision to not teach uh, performing arts, but we had clubs at some point and you know, it, would go, it would go in and out of existence. And that's where I really got involved and interested, but not in a really formal, like I am an artist, I am a writer kind of way. Mm -hmm. I actually, it was reading, it was reading Patrick Chamoiseau, who is a Caribbean writer who writes this book called School Days and he writes originally in French. It was reading him. And then James Baldwin, when I was like, oh, this is it, you know? And, right, in a, right, in a, right. and it was in a Trinidadian professor's class I had made sure I found her and in my second year, um, we were given writing exercises and, and to write in response to those. And that's when I really started considering myself, okay, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it was never separate from performance. And I don't think it was ever like, neither came first. Um, and so there I would take theater and dance classes, even though I was an English major. Um, and I was trained in, you know, devised theater and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I think my experiences in drama club and then in literature classes, both at QRC, um, were the things that really sowed those seeds. Right, of, right, um, right. You know? So yeah. I, I want to talk about um, Pray Daddy now. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, I, People oftentimes think, you know, well, an artist kind of makes work and there's a clear, you know, beginning of the work of the making process mm -hmm. and a clear end of the making process. But it seems yeah. like this project, it has it has several layers and there isn't really a, a desire to kind of give it a, de a definitive final kind of, you know, yeah. outcome. Right. It's an ongoing yeah. uh, project. Um, if we could uh, share the, the next video, please. So 
you describe this project as a digital memorial, or at least this iteration of it, which is mm -hmm. uh, 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 the this digital version. There's other parts. There's this a performance the part. There's a yeah. gallery part. Um, but yeah. this part of it, um, you described as it's titled memory, and mm -hmm. and in your description of it, you talk you call it a digital memorial. Um, yeah. And so I. When I read that, I was like, you know, we don't often think about the digital environment as a space where sacred practices occur. Right. You know? I mean, right. I think, right. well, you know, in our recent context where there's so much kind of live streaming and, and the churches have kind of jumped on it and so on, it's like there is this equation now with worship and the online world. But generally, we think about the, the online world as more of a secular space, right? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think that has something to do with the way in which, you know, once again, back to this issue of privacy is that we don't assume that we have the, the, opportunity, the ability to seclude ourselves um, when we're online, right? We assume mm -hmm. a level of visibility. Yeah. Um, so in, in approaching this, this project, um, which is a memorial for your father who passed away, something that is really, um sacrosanct you know mm -hmm. um and trying to have this conversation with a with a an elder who has passed on you have chosen to to have this conversation in digital space to have this sacred metaphysical experience yeah. here so i was mm -hmm. wondering if if you could talk a little bit about how you see um virtual space or digital space um and how it Offer, what it offers us when we are trying to deal with the metaphysical or the spiritual. Mm, yeah. No, um, I really love the way that you worded that um, because I really do believe that uh, the digital is a metaphor, right? And it's a really fertile metaphor for the spiritual experience. Um, when I think of the digital, I think of um, something that Kathleen Fitzpatrick writes about, she calls it um, networked subjectivity, right? So the idea that thinking of the blog as a piece of writing with these links, right? And so it's networked to these other websites. And so thinking of like an individual thing that is composed of several parts, um, not only does it have fertile kind of like linkages to the nature of body and spirit, you know what I mean? Like as our bodies are connected to spirit and like mm -hmm. how we can, you know, how we think about that. But there are also fertile metaphors for Caribbean existence and, and like, like Creole people are perhaps the most networked, <laughs> you know, like subjective people in the world, arguably. Um, and so there's a, there's something about that that was attractive to me. And then something about the way in which it can rearrange time, right? Um, right. So for instance, yeah. in these, yeah, and Go ahead. sorry. Okay, I was gonna say in this- Yeah, no, I, I was gonna do exactly what you're about to do, Amir, so go ahead. <laughs> Good. Um, in the memory, what happens is that um, the memory is composed of um, writing, video, and audio work, right? that are presented on screen via, um, via a website. And we use Twine. Twine is an open source platform that we use to organize them. And one thing we were, well, I, one thing I was interested in is how do I represent memory when the thing remembered is absent? Um, especially in the way that memory works for me, which is that it happens over and over. And every time it happens, it happens differently, you know? So how do I represent this moment when I remember that, you know, my father has passed away? Mm -hmm. So what um, the digital allowed me to do, and I really have to thank Andrew Smith from the Immersive Realities Lab for the Humanities and Marissa Parham and Sheila Chukulosier, who also worked with me on this, uh, for figuring this out was to completely randomize um, this sequence. And so every time you go in, you start and you end at the end. Um, you at the you start and end at the, in the same at, place. Yes, you start and end in the same place, but the journey that you take is completely individual. 
Just to uh, tell folks, so how this how this um, interface works when you when you enter the project, mm -hmm. there's um, there's text on the screen, and yeah. then we're hearing Amir voice the text, and mm -hmm. then there's either a, a photograph or a video yeah. that we we view as we're hearing him voicing uh, th this succession of memories of of this of. Uh, engagements with his father who's yeah. passed on. So when we come in, we always land on the same page. Yes. And yeah, when we leave, we always end on the same page. Yeah. But the way in which we encounter each piece, each individual bit of text and video is randomized every yes. time you you go yes. in. So there's no there's no real there, there's a beginning and end but you leave the the control of the beginning of the middle up to chance, right? Yeah, and that's I think that was meant to kind of on my ruminations on memory to to to, to represent that process of you know remembering because when you remember something, it's the same thing that you're remembering, but the way you remember it is different every time. And so it was the point to like deepen and widen that place of memory. Um, and let people come into a specific memory of mine, you know? And it was composed of um, different dreams that I had that my father, you know, appeared in after his death and, you know, just different things that I was, and the writing that um, composes this digital thing was my senior thesis, which was a novella right. about my father's life. Um, and the entire thing is called The Pre Daddy Project, uh, which I call a digital juvie because juve seems to be the like the most specific kind of way to connote that um this project is is an opening it's a it's a threshold more than anything else yeah that's as much as i was saying i, I want to uh go back uh, um to an earlier uh issue that that came up in our talk um in there mm -hmm. this question of of audience Mm -hmm. and, and the role that audience plays. Um, when you conceive of a work, like, you know, in, in, in this case, we could talk about Pray Daddy. Do you, do you think about the audience? I mean, is that part of, of how you are making choices around vocabulary, both, both you know, textual, vocal, and visual? Um, mm -hmm. Hmm. And if if so, um, how does it how does that awareness of audience shape your choices around around your vocabulary? Yeah, um, honestly, very rarely do I think specifically about audience. Most of so most of my work come um, originates in the body or in writing, and they're always like on the same level for me. So. Either it's, you know, I've rehearsed something or I was doing a propositional movement and that led to some writing or writing leads to images or whatever. And um, with Pray Daddy, for instance, uh, with this, this is a question my director asked me, um, the piece that I'm preparing for the end of October, Pray Daddy, the prayer. Um, is the Which is a, a performance work. It's a performance work, yeah. That's going to be on on um, digital via Streamyard, actually. Okay. Um, and it's directed by Zoe Sazel, who is a local director, and uh, theater director. Yeah, theater director, actress, you know, producer, all the things. And she asked me this question, and what came up for me immediately was like my primary audience honestly, is almost always myself, like, so, and I think about it, like, you know, when you send a tweet, well, you don't, you probably don't tweet, but um, if you tweet and you send a tweet on this, Does it show? Funny, you know, you go back and you look at your tweet sometimes and you laugh to yourself, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, my work is all kind of like that. It all begins in this thing that I feel I need to say. Um, sometimes it's directly to my father, but, even if I'm speaking to him, uh, sometimes the voice is more directed at me. Like it's in more of a poetic voice that I would understand. But I, you know what I mean. Do you find Do you find that that 
you know, yeah. kind of ignoring the pressure of audience or the demand of audience liberates your voice? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So recently for Pray Daddy, um, the, the performance I'm doing, I've leaned into comedic writing. I was, I've been watching, um, oh, oh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel. And I was like, oh, like comedy makes sense for me. And I didn't know why, why I hadn't included, included it in my performance work before. So I started writing comedy. And of course with comedy, you have to like take some risks, you know? Yeah. And, um, but knowing that I was trying to make myself laugh primarily was the thing that kind of like, you know, led me to some really true and really resonant moments. Mm -hmm. And I think all art, the more specific it is, is the more universal that it can it, be. I, I really, really uh, felt that, you know, with the last segment, um, that is the, the consistent ending point of the, mm -hmm. the online um, piece for Pray Daddy is called Amen. Mm -hmm. where your mom has a video camera and she's she's talking to you yeah and she's showing an area where uh I, she and your father would go to hang out or a lane yeah. um and it was i was watching and i was you know i wondered whether she was she aware that this was going to be available to the public or was she communicating in a way where she felt like she was only talking to you and then you took that mm -hmm. video and made it public, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think she was aware that there would be some audience other than myself because at that point it was a school project, right? Mm -hmm. So she probably thought it would be shown in class or something. Right. And um, I didn't ask her to speak in that clip. And so I remember receiving the clip and being like, what is she doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it added this really wonderful texture to it like yeah. um to bring the grief out of the personal and kind of like locate it in this thing that is shared and right. this thing that is really tender and of course the way that she addresses me gets to that tenderness and gets to that 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 personal nature and i think that's one of the things i love about um so much of the work that i do is sometimes it it, it, it calls on family and friends and familiar voices uh, and those populate the work. Similar to that piece I did in New York, I was dancing to the voices of my friends. Right, you know? right, right. No kind of like, like those voices kind of propel, like my work, all of my work is a freedom work, right? right. Like those kind of voices, my mother is my friends and my family members. Um, give me wings. Yeah. That's kind of corny though. <laughs> it, it, well, you know, I, I had a similar experience when I encountered, um, that when I was, you know, kind of starting my journey with photography, I came across uh, Deborah Willis's writing about family albums. Mm, that's and it changed, it changed my life. It totally changed the way in which I understood photography's role in the world. You know, it's like mm -hmm. while I was at school and I'm training, I was thinking very much about, you know, kind of high professional photography and that kind of thing. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, no, photography has this, you know, has this other element that is that is really really powerful and it is not about you know you know high production value or perfection mm -hmm. with composition and things like that it was um it was a more um i guess e emotional thing um yeah. metaphysical thing you know where you yeah. you kind of connect to these objects as relics of memory you know so i look for, 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 from the time I, I read that that text i um I've never been able to think about photography with, you know, even when I'm operating in like full pro mode without that awareness, you know, right? Yeah. Um, how, yeah. how human it really is, you know, yeah. how much it depends on that. Yeah. Um, I want to, before, before we get into questions and this, I guess would be, would be quite a nice way to segue into the questions. If we look at yeah. um, our final clip, which is uh, the performance version of, uh, Pray Daddy that you you did at Harvard. Yeah. Um, so let's just have a, a quick look at this clip and then we can chat. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's a great question. 
question. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, I, I really um, enjoyed um, being introduced to your work, uh, Amir, because it really does have, you know, such a, a wide breadth of form. You know, you seem really comfortable operating on a page in, you know, conventional theatrical environments um, in you know, nonlinear performance work is, is really, you know, and then also in, in conventional media modes as well, where you're doing like uh, just kind of um, really conventional um, uh, interview type work with, with the stuff that we saw at the top, you know? Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, thank so you. I guess at this point, um, with regard to our time, we should open up to, to questions. Um, do we have questions? There we go. Oh, hi, Andre. <laughs> okay, definitely an astute reading of the gender politics of spaces in TT. Where there are, were there other areas that came to mind in TT society, especially? Mm. Yeah, um, other than barbershops in terms of like, for this particular project, since it was based on our fathers and Job and masculinity, we were thinking mostly of where do men congregate and you know, the bar shows up so much in our literature in, um, and yeah. Uh, and we were thinking of at some point um, doing a reverse exploration of femininity. Uh, and so some places came, well, only one place really, which is just a hairdressing salon slash, cause a lot of um, like my mom, for instance, she has her hair done at home, like her hairdresser comes to her home. And, yeah. Uh, so that could be an interesting place, but that's, yeah, that's a good thing to think about. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, hi, Fozia. Yeah. Yeah. What is, what is this first? V? V, I think very, very prescient. Oh, theater exploring the power of touch. I. This is, yeah, I'm sure my age now. <laughs> I wonder how that would be presented now with the fear currently associated with touching each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a question um, that we're trying to explore in this upcoming um, mm -hmm. performance of Pray Daddy the Prayer because it, it's all digital, right? So there's no live component, ex well, no in-person component, there is a live component. Um, and so we're, and I still don't have a, an answer to that. Like how do you reproduce um, proximity? Um, in some previous, like in a class I'm doing now at NYU, uh, when I'm doing my MFA in fiction, uh, a friend and I, a Jin Jin Zhu, who is a poet, um, and her book is out, coming out, so <laughs> get, get on it. Uh, we, we did this process where we did um, synchronized movement on screen. And so we asked people to touch the different parts of their faces, right? Mm -hmm. And then to imagine other people in class, you know, mm -hmm. um, as part of that performance piece. And so we're still digging deep into that, Fozia. So thank you. This is, this is why I, you know, I wanted to talk to you about why I made that question about, about spirituality and the digital space, because mm -hmm. definitely in this moment where, you know, touch has become uh, a taboo thing. Um, we yeah. are kind of looking for ways for the digital environment to approxim approximate experiences that we know don't normally exist there. Yeah, you know? yeah. And part of the way is turning inward, really, and recognizing Absolutely. that we can reproduce um, those sensations in the way that we in the way that we contextualize our own touch, you know? So, yeah. I wonder to what extent is the idea of transcendence a motivating aesthetic, ideological, philosophical, or spiritual catalyst oh, yeah. for Amir's creative process? Thank you, Yannick. Um, 
it's so central. And I, I use the term uh, freedom more. And I think a lot about redemption as well. For me, in a very literal kind of crass way, my ancestors didn't go through all of that for me to come and be oppressed. You know what I mean? Or to come and live in anything other than freedom. And um, it feels like every generation uh, within a family has to carry a particular lesson or, or a particular journey. And mine is to figure out, I think, um, yeah, like what is the expanse of freedom that is like that can live in this body? Like how wide is this body actually? Um, and that really propels me because I feel like in the, in the personal stories that I offer, they're all an invitation into taking that journey with me. And so hopefully what they do is they inspire people to see, you know, ways of engaging in, in their own freedom and also ways in defending other people's freedoms, uh, especially marginalized people. So, yeah. How does your performance work and and work? How does your performance and work address homo biases in the character? Mm, okay, thank you, Rosie. Uh, so this particular performance of uh, Pray Daddy, the prayer, rather than a digital memorial, it it does the work of um, it's, I call it a coming out letter to my late father, and so it's all the things I I couldn't have said. Um, and it's exploring, it's exploring not only like finding the voice first to say the thing, to say like, I am queer or I am gay or I am, you know, whichever identity, but also finding the words to say all that that means, right? And for me, the impetus is in describing these personal instances that for me, um, reflects something about how masculinity in the Caribbean uh, represses and restricts queer people. Um, part of that is about one exploring this personal truth, so that people can like start thinking about you know the ways that they engage with masculinity and stuff like that in a, in a similar way. You know what I mean? Um, and so this particular piece is more of a this is what it means to be queer in this country. This is what it means to live in a masculine body and engage in femininity in this country. Um, and so it talks about homophobia. And it also talks about the places where I've found, you know, uh, found welcome, um, which is equally important. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Do you think the way we process memory reflects the impact of politics on the body? Hmm. Um, what I think about in response to this question, thank you, Andre. That's a great question. Uh, I hear um, memory, the impact on the politics, impact of politics on the body. I think specifically about how Caribbean folks think of origin and think of memory. So for instance, I'll use my, my, my families, mm -hmm. my families as, as an example. Um, memory seemed really like fluid and loose to me growing up, right? So we had one family album and of course, you know, we probably couldn't afford cameras at the point when, you know, everybody had them. So we don't, at least in my unit, my nuclear unit, we don't have like a lot of images, you know. Um, my mother, um, my mother has used to have this pouch of like baby hair, like you know, my plaits and my brother's plaits from when we were younger. I don't know where that is, right? And so there's a way in which, having grown up low income, we moved a lot. Um, and so like the physical kind of demands and limitations of, of, um, of, of, of poverty, I think affect memory, right? And so I think for me, what that means is that in a personal politics, the body became, becomes the primary place of memory for me, right? 
So to remember my father, I have to assess, I, there's no correct memory, right? There's, there's no, and I have to trust my body in letting me know, okay, this is the thing I remember and this is how I remember it. On the flip side, I think also about how people think about origin here and how they're also always hearkening back to these mythic homes of India oh, right. and China and Africa. And I'm beginning to think that that um, no longer serves us as, as much as we think it does. And I'm wearing a Kenyan shirt <laughs> as I talk about this, but this is from my friend Naya and her mom in Tanzania. Shout out if you're here. But um, yeah, what I, what I think about is how can we then assert our agency of over memory, right? How can we say Trinidad is our origin? And what does that mean for, we are the youngest nations on earth, you know? So there's this prerogative then to create a, a way of remembering um, that is new, that will, that addresses us and isn't inherited from like Europe or other places. So that's what I think about. Okay, I think we actually have, have one last question, Amir. Okay, yeah. Cool. All right, last one. Do you, right. Do you believe the arts and the media we consume can encourage the necessary change needed in the Caribbean for the next generation? Absolutely. What role will artists play? Yes, to the first question. Um, I really believe that, I mean, artists do so many things now, right? And so even somebody who is in like a PhD program um, and then, you know what I mean? They're, or a professor like could be like an artist or like somebody who is working, you know, in a bank or something can be an artist. And so I think we all also have to think about our own kind of like as individuals, not depending too much on the artist to do the work of envisioning better futures. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it's also important, the role for me that artists play, like artists really are um, seers, you know? Um, for me, <laughs> artists are like, I, I see artists aligned with, and this is like maybe like controversial, but like Obia people. <laughs> or like, you know, there's this way in which we engage um, we engage the spiritual, even if, if, even if we don't acknowledge it as such or name it as such, uh, we engage the spiritual and we manifest and manifesting and, and creating is a specifically spiritual energy. And so the role that I think we play is, is one, manifesting futures um, or better futures or better realities before they happen or before they're possible, right? And in that way, making them seem possible to present audiences. And I think it's like, it's like an angel who heralds, like, you know, the Lord has come. You know, we, we can be like that. We can say, this better world is coming. Um, let's prepare for it and let's make it actually, yeah. Amir, it, it really was such a, a pleasure to meet you and to get introduced yeah. to your, your work. There's so much more to talk about, but unfortunately, we, we've only had, we only have an hour. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I look forward to our conversation uh, continuing beyond the, the salon. And I, I think this is probably what, what the salon's um, success market is, is that it is connecting um, artists that wouldn't, that probably would never cross paths, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so th this was really a treat for me to 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 see your work. Thank um, you, Russell. It was a treat for me as well. And thank you to Catapult, American Friends of Jamaica, Kinson Creative, and Freshman Barbados for having me. Um, this was really a pleasure, and this is important work. So, yeah. um, I also want to remind folks that. Um, Catapult uh, will have uh, another session this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, I will be the dis in discussion with Jamaican uh, filmmaker and visual artist Rachel Chin. 
Um, and finally, uh, you know, I also want to express a thanks to the Catapult Partners, the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making the series possible. Also, um, and to remind folks that, you know, the, the conversations that are being uh, presented here are actually archived and available on the Fresh Milk website. So please do, uh, sorry, the Fresh Milk YouTube channel. So please do visit um, and keep watching. Take care. <laughs>